Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> Peggy. Yeah. As a parent and as a concerned citizen, I want to thank you first and foremost for writing this important book. Aw, thank you, Chris. Uh, it has given me immense gratitude for not being a teenage boy in these demented <laughs> and godless times. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, it is a wonderful book. It's full of boys and sex. And my first question is, uh, how did you, how did you manage that journalistically? How did you get all of these boys? What was your life like when you're, <laughs> <laughs> when you're interacting with all of these boys who are and still all, am, yeah, and still are, yeah, and who are opening up to you? I know. really deeply. These As we like were having dinner interviews. tonight, I looked down and said, "Oh, one of the guys is texting me." Um, yeah. yeah. Before I say that, I just want to make one little comment about you, which is that I, I really was excited to have Chris participate in this conversation, not only because he's a great writer and a dad, but also because he's somebody who has been really thinking a lot about issues around masculinity and um, has been in a men's group for 20 years, and we've had a lot of conversation around this, so it's really um, exciting to be doing this together. Um, so. You know, I had been writing about girls for a long time, and, and I came to this book after writing um, Girls and Sex and going around the country and feeling like um, everybody, wherever I went, was saying to me, when are you gonna write about boys? You know, we need a book about boys. And I kept thinking, yeah, somebody else's job, really. Um, and I worried that if I tried to talk to boys that I would have entire transcripts full of, uh-huh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> You know, they don't have a reputation for chatting. Nope. Um, nope. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that we weren't, you know, nobody really was talking to boys about these issues at, uh, in a very new time, um, and, and nobody was listening to them. And so I started having these conversations, and uh, shortly after I began my research, the Me Too movement really took off, and people, um, you know, the, the, the sheer magnitude and breadth of sexual misconduct um, in all, across all sectors of society became really evident. And it became imperative that we start talking about reducing sexual violence. But for me, writing about young people, I also felt like it was this opportunity to engage boys in conversation about um, sex and gender and power dynamics in gender and intimacy and masculinity. So I started doing what I did with girls, which was just kind of going around and talking to boys, and I and over and you know and then also looking into the research and having that be kind of the undercurrent of the book. But I talked to over a hundred guys um, who were a similar demographic to the um, girls in the, in the girl book. So they were either college bound or in college. Um, but beyond that, they they spanned a great range, cities and small towns, different ethnicities, different religions, different sexual orientations. And so that's all by way of like background to lead into your question, which was why did they talk to me basically, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> and I can't say that there was any like secret to that. People feel like, I feel like people want to tell me like what the trick was or how I bamboozled boys into telling me their deepest, darkest feelings in the most graphic language possible. Um, <laughs> And my only response to that is that I think that nobody asks them and that it was really unusual for boys to have this protected space where they could explore their interior lives and explore these issues and that because we're at a time of change in the culture, they were more able to and interested in sort of narrating that their experience and, and had more insight into it than maybe they would have 10 years ago. It sounds like they weren't just willing to do it. They, they were eager. They were eager. Yeah, and yeah, they really were. And some still want to keep talking to you. Yes, they do. Even though the book's out. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and, and, I and I think that the, the other piece probably is that, you know, I, I have been writing about kids for a long time, and, when I've, and I learned a lot writing Girls and Sex, and when I first started writing that book, I did a terrible job interviewing. I was a disaster, seriously. I, I would... Um, I think because I would bet betray shock and surprise, I, mean, I would just be like, what? <laughs> you did what? Um, or or my, you know, my face, I just would be judgmental. And the, when I would do that, those girls in those early interviews 
never spoke to me again. They ghosted me. They wouldn't return an email. They wouldn't return a text. It was done. I was dead. And so I really had to stop and think about how can I talk to kids and ask questions in a way that they will respond. And I think that piece was about having a kind of um, open and curious and non-judgmental stance in interviews and allowing people to explore things, sort of like a therapist, not unlike a therapist in a way, um, but with a different intent. Um, which I acknowledge as the parent of a teen myself is harder to do when it's your own child. <laughs> but um, I think that that's, that's the hope. So don't fly off the handle when we're talking to them. Well, uh, you know, I do it all the time. I do that with my, you know, I'm always like, you did what? I do that with my kid, right? But, but, but I try to then say, stop and go, okay, that was not the right way to approach that situation. Can we please try that again? I'm sorry. And, and see if I can do it a little better. Okay, I really do want to sort of geek out on the journalistic aspect okay. of this. Like, how, how did you, I, love I that. mean, a hundred people. Yeah. How did, how do you, how long did you spend on this book? First of all, was years. It? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, mean, did you have like a dedicated phone? Because if getting yeah. like text from a hundred young no, they're people. not all texting me all okay, the time. Right. Only a handful do that. But no, and I and I I found them in all kinds of different ways. You know, I had a pretty strong network from um, girls and sex of educators and academics um, who would help me um, find <laughs> subjects to interview. Uh, so um, it, w it was easier from that perspective because I was a known quantity. There was also an aspect of this book, and I don't, I don't know if it was because I was a known quantity or because of the way we th think of boys and girls differently, but with the girl book, I felt that people, it was harder to find girls to talk to me. And with this book, especially with parents, when I would go out speaking, like in a situation like this, um, people who wanted books signed afterwards or people who wanted, they would say, I hear you're writing a book about boys. Let me give you my son's phone number. Let me give you my son's email. You know, you need to talk to these boys. And I, I think that there was a way that, I mean, maybe we're less protective of boys, but I think also there was a way that maybe there was a hope that the interview would also be an educational experience for sons. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like it was. In some cases. Well, yeah. I mean, they would talk, some, for some guys, I think it was transformative or therapeutic or cathartic um, or gave them just a chance to talk about that. But I think that that also reflected that we don't, we really don't talk to our boys. Um, we don't talk to our girls that much. I mean, that was true in girls and sex for sure. But we talk to our boys less. And what we do tend to say in a conversation about sex is, um, you know, don't get a girl pregnant. Uh, don't get a disease, and what boys said that their parents always said to them, and this was true as true in progressive communities as less progressive communities, um, was you know respect women. That was the end of the conversation. And that piece, you know, one guy said to me, "That's like saying don't run any over any little old ladies, and then handing your son the car keys." You know, he doesn't think he's going to run over any little old ladies, but you still don't know how to drive. You know. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump to porn because the oh porn God. was... Um, <laughs> That's a big leap, I Chris. Know, I know, but it's just, it was, it's like flashes in the book. It's just so... Um, it's not clear till chapter two, but yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I just think uh, it's amazing to me that you got these boys to speak so frankly about that because that is such a taboo. Um, and also, um, it's so different than I think a lot of people a little older uh, than uh, the people in this book yeah. are aware of. I mean, porn has changed in the last 10 years. That whole landscape yeah. has totally changed. And um, uh, it, it just seems like that's a huge part of what you were uncovering about boys and sex is, this, is the way they relate to porn. Well, yeah. I mean, it, wasn't, it, was, um, it was a big thing they wanted to talk about. And I, and I think it's because of that changing landscape. And it's another place, I mean, you know, we can talk about porn and we can talk about mainstream media because there's, I think sometimes we get so lost in the porn conversation that we forget about the even possibly greater impact of mainstream media on kids. But um, it's another place that that disconnection for boys, which 
we kind of left over, but the, the sort of um, idea of emotional disconnection and sex sexist status seeking and conquest um, and, and partners as disposable gets sort of reinforced. Um, and what, what and, and, and I always want to frame this discussion by saying, um, you know, curiosity about sex is normal. Masturbation, yay. Um, you know, great for the girls, great for the boys, great for everybody in between and beyond. Um, and, uh, and we can have discussions, you know, in another context about whether there's all kinds of, you know, whether there's feminist porn or ethical porn or queer porn or other sort of stuff, but that all tends to be behind a pay paywall even so. And what changed, what changed, and why you say the last, it's actually the last 12 years, is that um, Pornhub came online and dropped the paywall on hardcore porn. So for the first time, um, you could get, it wasn't just the internet, it wasn't just the smartphone, it was this accessibility that allowed kids to get anything that you can imagine and, you know, a lot of things you'd rather not imagine, um, right on your smartphone. And the kind of porn that tends to be the e most easily accessible keeps showing over and over this idea that sex is something men do to women, that female pleasure is a performance for male satisfaction, it's, you know, um, bodies are distorted and humiliation and degradation are often eroticized and um, and even things that in kind of the more vanilla clips probably wouldn't feel good to most people, especially women. So, um, and what has happened is that because parents don't talk to kids, because schools don't talk to kids, that becomes the de facto sex educator. And even though kids say, well, boys will say, well, I know the difference between fantasy and reality, that's not really how media works. How media mm -hmm. works is it affects, even when we think it doesn't, our thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. And they are bringing those thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors into their personal lives and into the bedroom with them. I think one of the reasons that the porn section leapt out of me is because um, it makes it, it, it drives home how, how these narratives and these ideas go in to fill that void if, yeah. if parents um, filling it themselves. If they're not having these talks, if they're not starting this dialogue at an right. early age. And, and I know that, you know, you'd rather poke yourself in the eye with a fork than talk to your son about his porn use, but, um, <laughs> but I think that we really do, I mean, it's a place that we really do have to get in there and have discussions um, with boys about what's real, and girls too, because girls tend to, gr girls have a tendency to look at it as a um, manual that, to tell them what boys want. Um, which is its own problem. Um, so talking to kids about what's real and what's not and what's missing um, from porn is super important. But like I said, and we can talk more about this if you want, but I feel like sometimes we then don't talk about the mainstream stuff. And the fact is that you could um, block every triple X site and seriously, good luck with that. Um, but you could try and uh, you would you still- should, You should tell them about the big Bob's guy. He was my favorite. Oh, the boy who, who tried to get around his parental, um, what are those things called, restriction thingies, um, by, yeah, typing big bobs. <laughs> it's a, it's a phrase that stays with you, um, big yeah. bobs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's so low level in terms of what they <laughs> said. That's very FCC friendly. Um, <laughs> since we're on the radio, we gotta be careful. Uh, but, um, um, main, you know, mainstream media, w any sexual content, um, kind of uh, whether it's whether it's TV or um, video videos or uh, social media or video games or whatever kids are absorbing um, is linked with um, you know risky sexual behavior and earlier sexual debut and more partners and belief in rape myths and sexual harassment I mean it's not just porn and sometimes I think um, that then we don't look at things like what like um, a researcher at University of, at Indiana University was talking to me about this. He's a porn researcher, but he was saying, you know, I think sometimes the entire Adult Swim lineup on the Cartoon Network has more impact on kids, like because it creates these media primes where that that sort of um, encourage you to think a certain way. So, like if you see Family Guy, and there's an episode of Family Guy where the guy goes next door and opens the garage door and a bunch of scantily clad um, Asian women who are apparently being kept in there as sex slaves come running out and that's very funny, um, of course. And it, it's not gonna make you think it's okay to keep Asian women as sex slaves, he said, but it might m give you the media prime of 
it's okay to objectify Asian women or more okay to objectify Asian women. So there's all these ways that media affects us that, um, yes, porn, but not only porn. And so I think, if I may take one more beat on this, um, one of the things I've thought a lot about as somebody who's written about girls is that we have done a much better job of creating media literacy for girls. You know, like as parents, as advocates, as activists, as therapists, we've really recognized in the last 20 or so years how um, harmful the messages the media, that girls absorb from the media can be in terms of their body image, in terms of their self-esteem, in terms of their cognition, in terms of mental health. And we try to arm our girls and prepare them so that they can have that critical lens when they look at the media. But boys are swimming in the same stew. And sometimes the heat is turned up higher. And uh, we, we don't talk to them at all. So I mean, I feel like that's one place that isn't even that hard, that isn't even that, you know, poke yourself in the eye type of a conversation or awkward or eye rolling um, that, that, that we can make a difference with boys. It seems like we're also in this weird place with boys where they, they know that they shouldn't believe that stuff. Intellectually, they can say, porn is not realistic or uh, this mainstream media representation of men and women is no good. But at a sort of visceral level, what they um, think a guy should be is not quite as evolved. Right, and, and it was interesting to talk to boys about, you know, I would always do this lightning round of what's an ideal guy? Um, because on one hand, and this was also something that interested me in terms of somebody who'd written about girls, because I felt like a lot of what I was working on with girls over the years has been this contradiction and this tension between all the new ideas that we have about girls and all the old stuff that we haven't really gotten rid of. And so I guess it wouldn't, shouldn't be too surprising that the same is true for boys. So on one hand, you know, guys would talk about girls, you know, girls deserving of their place in the classroom or on the playing field or in leadership or in professional roles. On the other hand, when I'd say, what's the ideal guy, guy, um, they would come out with, it sounded like they were channeling 1955, right? They would say, um, you have to be athletic, you have to be dominant, you have to be aggressive, you have to, um, sexual conquest, uh, and the big one was emotional suppression. You know, you, you, you put up the wall and you don't show anything besides anger and happiness. Um, yeah, it was, it was fascinating. And they're not just getting that from bad dads. That, that was sort of eye-opening. I mean, some no. of them have, have sort some, of well, stunted. Now, let's, let's not put that judgmental lens on quite. But yeah, for sure, some of the guys had dads. I mean, what, what, what research shows is that, si that most boys say that the source of those restrictive messages about masculinity, and we know that those messages are really unhealthy for boys, that, there is, that boys who, who um, hew to those values most strongly are, you know, engage in riskier sexual behavior, they're more likely to be in car accidents, they're more likely to binge drink, you know, it goes on and on, more likely to commit suicide, more depressed, lonelier, et cetera. So it's kind of a, you know, it's an unhappy place to be inside of what they call the man box. Um, but what m boys say that they get the restrictive messages about masculinity from their parents and mostly from their dads. And what I would see with boys was that they didn't necessarily, you know, some of them would say, yeah, my dad said, you know, would tell me to man up or don't be a little bee. But that was not that common. Um, more often they would say things like the guy who said, you know, my dad wasn't sexist. He wasn't homophobic. I didn't learn that so-called, you know, toxic masculinity from him. But I did learn the emotionally stunted side of masculinity because he would never talk about, you know, feeling and he was more of like a, a sigh and walk away kind of a guy than the kind of guy who'd engage you and talk about what was going on. Do you Do want to sigh and walk away? <laughs> <laughs> I it's saw It's tempting, it. it's tempting, I know. yeah. I uh, saw you about to do it. <laughs> I'm supposed to have like a feeling? Connect, Chris, <laughs> connect. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for those reasons more, it, 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 one thing that becomes really clear in this book is that merely raising boys in a, in a thoughtful and caring and non-idiotic home is not enough. <laughs> you, have to, um, you have to say out loud these things that you would think you don't need to... Would be self-evident? You would yeah. think they're patently obvious, yeah, that, that caring about whether your partner is enjoying sex is important. Well, and what constitutes that? I mean, one of the, one of the things that 
do you mind if I interrupt on this? I do not mind. The, 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 uh, because I, one of the things in girls and sex that, was, that always was coming up was that, particularly in a hookup, there's, there's a much bigger orgasm gap, right, than, than in relationship. And, and that, um, you know, male pleasure was presumed and female pleasure was, you know, nice if it happened. Um, and that guys would say, back when I was writing Girls in Sex and also when I was writing Boys in Sex and we talked to boys that like, I know it's bad, but in a hookup I don't really care, you know? And, um, and what was, but what, what I found when I interviewed the boys for this book was that they did care about female satisfaction. They just didn't define it the same way. And so since so much of a hookup, and I may be bouncing ahead here, I don't know, but so much of a hookup is about the story in the room, the story you're gonna tell your friends, um, and the invisible audience in the room and not, you know, what's actually happening between the two people. Um, what, they, what they wanted to be sure of was that the story the girls were going to tell was going to involve stamina and size. Let's stay FCC friendly again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. And so um, one of the boys that I talked to said, you know, he, would, he got in the habit of looking at the clock before he would start intercourse on a hookup so that he would make sure that, as he said, you know, he was sufficient. And he said it wasn't really about the girl's pleasure necessarily, it was about making sure that his pride was intact and that when she went back to tell her friends what happened, that she wouldn't express disappointment and that he would be okay. So it was, so when you say, you know, you have to talk to your son about that, you, you even have to go deeper than that and say, and by the way, what guys are going to tell you constitutes that isn't right. Okay, I do want to get to hook up culture because yeah. that that whole animal is crazy. But um, but why is it that we have to say these obvious things to boys? Why are they? Well, I think we have to say obvious things to girls too. I don't think that's unique to boys. I think that that our kids are growing up in a really heavy. I, I mean, I just don't think that we have the luxury of the kind of silence maybe that our parents had with us. And even that, you know, it wasn't that stuff wasn't happening. It was that we weren't naming it, and you know, particularly as women, we kind of saw it as the price of admission. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't, you know, I, but but our kids are growing up with such a tsunami of culture coming at them that is constantly reinforcing some of the most retrograde messages about men and women and you know, transactional sex and commodified sex and all these different forms. So, if you're not talking to them about it. That's their, you know, the, the media will educate them. So we have to be a little, you know, more intentional and more specific. You know, there, there's a point in the book where I, with boys, where I talk about um, making caring, caring common, which is a, um, um, a, a organization run out of Harvard that looks at kids' moral development. And they w did a report where they were talking about misogyny and popular culture and, and harassment and all these different things. And they were saying, well, if you ask, the parents of young men, if they want their boys to grow up and be people of integrity, they would say, well, of course we do. But if you said, have you talked to, to them about the very specific ways that they could harass or you know, harm women or that the culture works on them to create this kind of misogynist um, environment, um, they would say, no, we have not had that discussion, even though you know, by high school, 90% of girls report being sexually harassed. So how does all of this feed into hookup culture? Um, and, and can you well, define what that is? Well, how doesn't it? You know, how doesn't it? Um, so again, you know, I mean, I feel, so I want to just back up and say that, you know, a lot of times when you write a book, you don't really find out what the book is about until you go out and start talking about it. Um, I mean, you think you know what it's about, but I feel like at the, what I've learned talking about this book is that at the heart of the book is boys is the taboo about vulnerability. Um, and, and boys in all these different forms, whether it's around masculinity or around pornography or around hookup culture or you know, in all these different ways that they're, they're, they're wrestling with either um, embracing or rejecting or deflecting or capitulating to vulnerability and the taboo that they, that they constantly encounter about expressing it. And that, you know, when you cut people off from their capacity for vulnerability, you not only cut them off from their humanity, but Brene Brown calls it, he calls emotional vulnerability the secret sauce that keeps relationships together. 
So you're, you're reducing their capacity to be able to attain and sustain the kind of relationship, mutually gratifying, personally satisfying relationship that we want our kids to have. And that not only harms the boys, but it radiates outward and, and can harm their romantic partners as well. And a lot of that kind of idea of hot sex with a cold heart, whether you're talking about porn or you're talking about you know, trying to um, you know, rack up your body count without caring about your partner or really about yourself and how you feel about it, finds its expression in hookup culture. And to be, just to define terms a minute, a hookup can mean anything, right? It's a completely meaningless word. It might mean kissing, it might mean you know, oral sex, it might mean, we don't know what it means when somebody says hook up. And it's deliberately... And it's deliberately amb ambiguous, ambiguous uh -huh. so that people will overestimate what their peers are doing, um, which can lead to unwanted, you know, in, engaging in unwanted sex or, or being somebody, or, or being coercive so that you can get the kind of experience you think that your friends have. Um, hook up culture is um, the idea that casual, I mean, that, that casual sex pr precedes rather than, or that sex precedes rather than derives from emotional intimacy. And that casual sex is the kind of normalized pathway to a relationship rather than the exception, but that most hookups won't lead to a relationship. So does that, Yeah, you got that? I got um, it. Yeah, and, and part of the reason that most, um, hookups don't lead to a relationship is because the idea, there's this great book called American Hookup by Lisa Wade, she talks about all this a lot, that the idea is that after a hookup you're supposed to be less friendly than you were beforehand. So I would talk to boys, you know, girls would complain all the time about boys, you know, ignoring them or ghosting them after a hookup. So I would say to boys, you know, I, I was talking to one guy who said, yeah, he saw his hookup partner um, the day after and he just, they passed each other in the street and he averted his eyes. And I said, why did you avert your eyes? And she, he said, well, I don't know what she's thinking. Like, she might just think it was a thing at a party. And, um, you know, it, it, I, and there's that question there. And so I'm not gonna put myself out there if I don't know. And I said, so you would rather avert your eyes than take the tiny risk of saying hello and seeing if there was something more there. And he just went, yeah. You know, and again, and what he said was, you know, I, I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to be seen as weak. I don't want to be perceived as, I, I was always really interested in words, in phrases and words that boys would use, or girls too, um, and kids, to, you know, they use this word, um, cat, this phrase, catching feelings, like it's a disease, you know? Like you catch chlamydia, you catch gonorrhea, you catch feelings, you got to avoid that. And, and I got really interested in this idea of like, okay, so to avoid catching chlamydia and gonorrhea, you put on a condom. To avoid catching feelings, you have to put on an emotional condom. <laughs> and what is that emotional condom? What is it made of? Can you guess? Alcohol? Yes! <laughs> is it effective? <laughs> Not necessarily, but it, it becomes what, you know, the, Lisa says that it's, it, it that hookup culture is dependent on alcohol to create the compulsory carelessness next to a, that you need for a hookup. And so the trick becomes finding somebody who is drunk enough and being drunk enough yourself to say yes, but not so drunk that they can't consent, which tips you into, because boys are very clear, you know, know that having sex with an intoxicated person is assault. But you know, like, where are those lines and who judges? And, and even beyond that, the sex in those hookups tends to be pretty mediocre if you're drunk and you don't know somebody very well. And again, like I, at one point, I've got to do like a search in the book for how often people say the word vulnerable because it is so often. And, and what one of the boys said was, um, it's, like two, it's like two different people, ha it's like two people having two very distinct experiences. And there's not a lot of eye contact and there's not a lot of conversation. So it's like you're acting vulnerable but you're not being vulnerable with somebody that you don't know very well or care about, which is odd. And he said, not really very fun. 
Yeah, I was surprised by how little fun both sides seem to be having. It's being presented as fun, like this is what's fun. But I've never had a conversation with, I, so, it, so in the book I go into, um, <laughs> I go to a freshman pregame party, as one does, um, <laughs> because it's not at all awkward. <laughs> uh, Did and they think you were like a sophomore? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, and then um, the kids go off to the to their frat party. Would they're not gonna let me in? And um, oh, they offered to like put me in a hoodie. And I don't know. Anyway, and then I went back the next day, and we we sort of talked about the night and what had happened. And I had this conversation. It was one of the few conversations I'd had with boys and girls together. And that conversation, like every conversation I've ever had about hookup culture with young people, um, devolved into why they were ambivalent and disliked it. And that is, you know, that, that's pretty, and yet they participate anyway because it's what on offer, what's on offer and they always say, well, you know, it's better than nothing, kind of. Um, but they're always, not, the, the ambivalence around hookup culture is, 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 is huge. Uh -huh. It seems like there's that ambivalence and then there's also this weird schism that I, I was really struck by. It seems like guys at that age are super blasé about sex. I mean, like you said, the, the sort of the sex happens before any kind of relationship, and they just as soon have sex or hook, hook up as ask what time it is. But at the same time, they're totally preoccupied with sex. They want to know how they stack up right in their in the in the status and the hierarchy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's because it's about the story, and it's about the hookup culture is about what you're telling your friends and how you're stacking up for both boys and girls, you know, and, and I met guys and I met girls who were into it, you know, that they, they were cool with it and they, you know, the girls would say, I don't want to take care of a boyfriend. I don't, you know, I don't want to deal with that. Um, guys, whatever, they just didn't, they were fine with what they were doing. Um, most, most people were more, amb more ambivalent than that. Um, but what I always say is that to young people when I talk to them is, is, my job is not to tell you the context in which you are to be sexual. That isn't, you know, I just, what I want to do is demythologize um, hookup culture and the things that you're taught to believe ought to be true about it. And to say, you know, for, for girls, um, you'll get an adrenaline rush, a warm body, a story to tell your friends. You're a lot less likely to get good sex or the tools you would need in order to create a situation where you have good sex or emotional intimacy. And for boys, I'd say much the same, except that hookup culture also pretty much denies their capacity or interest in love. Um, one thing that I thought was really helpful here was what you, when you talk about Dan Savage, because he had a, a uh. different way of approaching these hookups. Um, it's not about consent in this sort of like letter of the law kind of way that always struck me as ridiculous it, like that we talk just about like whether the guy has consent rather than enthusiasm for example right but but Dan Savage has this way of approaching of this. yeah so well it was it, it was really it really came out of discussions that I had with gay boys and and sort of noticing when I was talking to gay boys that they had a very different um, attitude towards consent and that they were much better able to negotiate the parameters of a sexual encounter than straight kids. And partly, part of that was out of need. They had to because it wasn't as obvious who was going to be doing what with whom and how. So you had to learn, had develop language to talk about that. Um, but, and, and one of the gay guys that I talked to, you know, he was just like, I don't, this is pretty typical, he said, I, I don't understand the reluctance straight guys have to have this consent conversation because like when we talk about consent, that means we're gonna have sex. You know, that's great. Why would you not wanna do that? Um, but what Dan says, Dan who um, is a syndicated sex columnist in Seattle, um, that he, when I asked him about that, he said, well, there's the four magic words that gay guys use at the beginning of an encounter, which are, what are you into? And what I loved about that was that it's such an open-ended question. And so often when we're having this consent conversation, we frame it in terms of a series of predetermined questions that boys are asking girls usually um, that can be answered yes or no. 
And this opens it up to creating an experience that is more, you know, will work for everybody and everybody will enjoy. But that said, I have been thinking about this since, again, you find out more about what your book is about once it's out. And I've been thinking about that section of the book since it was published and realizing that Dan is a gay man and he has sex with men. I could have told you that. Yes. <laughs> that was my revelation. No, that's not, that's not it. I wonder if you put, if you took two heterosexual young people and a guy said to a girl, what are you into? Whether her response might well be, I have no idea. Because of the way, because of everything I wrote about in girls and sex and how girls are socialized. And you see in that kind of, I mean, I, I thought it was so interesting because you could see in that interchange that I just made up, but nonetheless, um, how, how people are socialized to sort of perpetuate these inequities in, in our interpersonal relationships. And what if we could get to a place where our young people could say and ask and answer the question, what are you into? And create an experience that really worked for them. One of the most powerful parts of the book for me was uh, a section where you talk about a, a situation where that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, uh, this is, I'm talking about Samir. Mm -hmm. Can you? Anwin and Samir. Yes, Anwin and Samir. Yeah, the restorative justice chapter. Can you tell that? Yeah. I mean, I do want to say one more, more thing about the whole cons consent thing, because I think another aspect of consent to me is thinking about the gender dynamics and socialization that can get in the way of young men seeing when, the, and I don't mean this to let them off the hook, but that, the, that, that can undermine ability to um, acknowledge personal accountability or to see when you've crossed line. I had a lot of guys who were wrestling with lines that they had crossed, and a lot of guys who refused to, to had done things that they refused to acknowledge, that they, that they sort of talked about but then would back off of. But talking to boys about some things like, um, you know, again, when, when guys are drunk, particularly, but even when they're not, but mostly when they are, they tend to over-perceive yes, and to see basically any friendliness on the part of a woman as meaning it's on. And I thought about that a lot because I thought about how often they will also say, I'm not a mind reader, you know, I, I, she didn't say no. I think, well, you're pretty clairvoyant when yes is concerned, you know? And, and understanding those dynamics, understanding that um, guys are prone, again, more so when drunk, but generally to see, you know, consent to one act, such as kissing, as equating consent to everything, or, cons or going back to a dorm room, that the place something happens equals consent, um, or that um, uh, they, they're likely to, especially when drunk, be less able to hear no, or perceive a partner's hesitation. So we talk a lot about these dynamics and hookup culture dynamics and alcohol where girls are concerned and the impact on girls of that, but we're not really talking as much about boys and that's not a kind of like shame or blame thing but just understanding how social how these aspects of socialization work so that really came into play in the story of Anwan and Samir and um and I, I think Stephanie's here so, Stephanie are you here there you are so I first heard about um Anwin and Samir um on uh Stephanie has a podcast called Reckonings and um they were on her podcast and their story just blew me away because what I what it allowed was looking at um, two sides of, um, of a sexual assault and um, the ways that uh, they got to know one another, um, they spent a night together, um, Samir walked away from it thinking bad hookup, um, Anwen walked away eventually recognizing that she had been assaulted and up until that point it was a fairly, you know, this happens on every Friday and Saturday night on campuses across the country. Um, but what happened afterwards was amazing because I think that one of the, you know, we, we're, there's so much work being done around campus sexual assault, but what I think is being recognized is that we can't expel our way out of it. We can't, you know, suspend our way out of it. We can't punish our way out of it. 
we need, on one hand, much better education before we get to this point about all these issues, um, but also other pathways that allow for um, justice and healing and accountability. And one of the places where um, that's being explored is in this idea of restorative justice. And so what they end up doing is a restorative justice process which prioritizes keeping control with the person who's been harmed, recognizing that the harm has created, this is a little jargony, but it's it, it created needs. When somebody's hurt, there's needs. And a lot of times what those needs are for a girl who's been harmed um, in, a, in a case of sexual misconduct are not that she wants to be um, some authority to come and take the power away from her to make decisions. She does not necessarily want somebody expelled. She does not necessarily want somebody, or he, um, uh, jailed. You want the person to be able to hear what they've done, understand the harm they've caused, and make amends for that harm. Um, and when, in a restorative justice process, the person who's caused the harm, in this case a guy, um, has to acknowledge that he's done so. But then the process is about trying to understand what it means to repair that harm and what it means to face up to that harm that you've caused and what amends you need to make um, to, to make up for that and to make that other person whole. And through the process, what's really amazing is watching Samir's evolution. Um, and I was tempted but after talking to him to think, this guy's a unicorn, you know, like he becomes such an incredible guy and he's such a mensch, you know, by the end of this chapter, he is the mensch of all mensches. Um, but the fact was where he started out was not at all unusual. You know, he talked to me about, you know, basically his sex ed was like the not very good in school, Van Wilder movies and porn, you know, and, and, and uncles who told him a night out wasn't successful unless you got a girl's phone number or grinded on a girl. He, he had been pretty coercive in high school, he realized in, rec in retrospect, with people that he loved even. Um, and he was, you know, really looking forward to being that frat boy at the party. Um, but this process allowed him to look his behavior in the eye and make a kind of transformation that I felt if he could make, um, other guys could too. So it was a chapter that to me I wanted to put in because I was trying really hard to figure out how can I contribute to this discussion around consent and assault in a way that's productive and not further, you know, it doesn't further polarize. And this really gave me that opportunity um, because I felt in the end it was a really hopeful, even though it's an after the fact solution, it, it was a really hopeful chapter yeah. and, and really showed that you know, change can happen and, and people can evolve and become the people that we hope they can be. Oh. So before the microphones were on, you were saying um, this was all phase one of your plan to emasculate all men yeah. and indoctrinate them with your Berkeley feminazi ideology. Um, you listened to Rush Limbaugh talking about me, didn't you? Rush Limbaugh's been talking about me, guys. Yeah. But in all seriousness, I'm. I was interested in that, and I sort of did a little like poking around trying to find that that commentary about the book because in the past I would have just dismissed them as trolls, but now that trolls run our country, <laughs> I'm sort of more interested. <laughs> and I wonder, like, what what do you make of these people who who are so adamant about defending boys will be boysism? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they just prove my points all the time, basically. Yeah. I mean, those guys who, who tweet at me or, or write to me and call me words I can't say and feminazi and various other things, um, I'm just, I just always think, yes, and you are proving exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. So, yeah. so you know, I mean, you have to learn. If, if you're, basically, if you are a woman performing journalism, you're going to get that stuff. I mean, all women who write get that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but what has been more striking to me has actually been the other mail that I've been getting because n over 90% of the, of the email and tweets and social media stuff that I get um, is positive. And I'm getting a lot from um, boys themselves 
who are expressing gratitude for feeling reflected and feeling like you know somebody has seen them and 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 I you know Karis Dennison who's a Bay Area educator talks about how young people and in this case boys they just want to feel seen and significant mm -hmm. and if they can't feel seen and significant in a pro-social way they will do it in an anti-social way um, and and it helped some boys you know to feel like they were being seen by this book and it's what I wanted from this book I wanted something that parents could read and, and see how guys were thinking and launch conversations with their boys, but also something that boys themselves could read and think about and maybe you know help them get beyond the guy talk to have a more meaningful dialogue with their peers or, or even just in their own head. Um, so seeing that happen has been really cool, getting email from parents who in, engaged with the book and decided to take the leap and talk to their sons in ways they never had before. Um, that, that's been super, I've gotten some email from women who said that their husbands have read the book and then their sex lives have improved, so <laughs> that's interesting. Um, and, uh, and then the thing that has been possibly th um, what I really didn't expect was uh, how much email I'm getting from men who are our age, men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, who feel like they had never been able to really tell their story and they were grappling with a lot of these ideas of masculinity and um, sex and gender uh, and they wanted, they, they send very long emails. Um, <laughs> I say that with no judgment. I mean, I, I, I read them. We often have a lot to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, but, but, but it, it really makes me recognize that, you know, I, I said early on, nobody talks to boys, nobody listens to boys. I, it's not unique. I mean, we don't, we, don't, we don't engage adult men and adult men don't engage one another very often um, in these kinds of conversations. I mean, I think you're really unique in having been talking to the same group of men in a really connected way for 20 years. That's remarkable. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I want to leave time for questions, but I have one more question. I want to know how, how, um, how this changed you. Uh, you know, you have, how did this change the way you think about the men in your life or the husband in your life? Do you, <laughs> do you see them differently? Um, I mean, I, th I think it just helps me to better understand the ways that the socialization of men and the socialization of women are, are a dynamic um, and that we need to sort of break it all open and look at all of it if we really want to make change. We can't only be talking to women and girls. We have to bring men and boys into this conversation. And I mean, I've grown up with big brothers. I have, you know, my husband of 28 or 29 years, I can't remember. Um, and uh, I have a lot of men in my life that I think are wonderful and men that I love and men that support me. Um, and, and that's, that's always been true. I guess one thing I kind of think about with this book is um, that the boys really expressed a desire to hear more about this from those men in their lives, whether it was fathers or uncles or coaches or father figures, um, to talk about um, sex and ethics and to talk about the emotional aspects of intimacy and to talk about even their own regrets. And I think that that's really hard for men to think about sometimes because they weren't parented that way um, and they haven't had those conversations. And I think what's important to know as a guy is that you don't have to be perfect. You know, you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know all the questions. You don't have to, you know, have the best relationship in your own life. You just have to start. And, and I think that if there's one message that comes ringing out loud and clear through this book, it's that you have got to start the conversation. You have got to start the conversation wherever you can, however you can, just start it somewhere. Yeah, that, that was... <laughs> that was one of many um, profound takeaways. Um, and. Uh, I would say I would go on about that, and I would make you say all kinds of spoilers. But I think we should let people <laughs> buy the book. Um, but yeah. let's first um, <laughs> take some questions from the sure. audience. Sure, okay. I can't see the audience, but somebody will. 
First question's right here on your left. Hi. Um, along the lines of if you don't exercise a muscle, you can't strengthen it. What's one suggestion you would have to address the vulnerability issue and kind of making that okay, easier? Yeah. I'm over here. Hi. Oh. <laughs> How would you encourage your young son, teenage son, to be more open to vulnerability? Um, well, I mean, that, that's a big question. It kind of depends on the age you're talking about. But there is something, I think, and this may be younger than you wanted me to go, but I feel like um, there's a lot of work that we can do around that with, with little boys, particularly, um, because the truth is, is that boys grow up in a more impoverished emotional landscape from the get-go than girls. Um, mothers have been shown to talk with less emotional range with their, son, with their infant sons and their infant daughters. And there's like research that shows, um, there's a classic study where uh, adults see a video of an infant reacting to um, a jack-in-the-box. And if they're told beforehand that the um, jack-in-the-box, uh, or that the infant, excuse me, was male, um, even if they're not actually male, they tend to um, say that the reaction the child has is anger as opposed to surprise or fright or something like that. And what boys tend to learn is that um, all that bucket of emotions that is um, sadness or grief or disappointment or, or frustration or you know, all of those things get swirled down and get funneled into anger, um, which is what they're allowed. And so I think with young guys, particularly young boys particularly, um, starting to name their emotions for them um, and, and helping them, you know, saying, wow, um, it seems like you're sad, or uh, that must be frustrating, or how did that feel, and trying to broaden their range of emotional expression whenever we can um, is, is so important to boys. And if they are kind of going straight to anger, trying to take a step back and going, okay, so what's underneath that anger that they're expressing? Is there another emotion that we can talk to them about? Um, so, that is one thing um, that I think is, is, is really important with, with little kids. And with older boys, I think, you know, starting to have these conversations about the, what happens to boys and what happens to their emotional vul vulnerability and encouraging them just to take, you know, small little, it takes courage to be emotionally vulnerable. And if, you know, we see courage as somehow being um, what guys are sort of trying to express with their masculinity, let's put it in the right spot, maybe. Here on your right. Hi. Oh. I wrote my thesis 20 years ago about girls and sex, and I leveraged a lot of your writing, so it's very cool to see you here today. Thank you. Um, and since then, till now, I've always been um, perplexed by what drives parents' wariness in talking about physical pleasure and sex with their kids. And I'm curious, like, if you have thoughts on that, like, why it's so uncomfortable. I mean, my kids are really little now, and so uh -huh. I'm like, oh, am I going to now, when they get older, not be able to talk to them about this? <laughs> you know, like, what drives that? And um, do we, are there tips? Yeah, well, it's not our culture. You know, it's just not, it's not how American culture works. We don't, we don't have that conversation. And I, I, I talk a lot, particularly in girls and sex, about the Dutch um, and how there's a really different idea about um, talking really openly within the family about sex. And so in, in America, there's um, a book called Not Under My Roof by um, Amy Shallot that compares American and Dutch attitudes towards teenagers and sex. And she talks a lot about how Americans, um, American kids are forced to express their maturity or growing up by lying to their parents. And you know, you go out and you like, you're partying, you're getting drunk, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're having sex, and your parents know it's happening, but we just pretend you know, that it's not. Um, and, and then you come home and you act like a different person in front of your parents. Um, so you're creating this schism, whereas in Dutch families, um, they have, I'm gonna mangle this word, because I don't know how you say it, but it sounds something like gezelligheid. Um, I don't know, which is, um, means cozy togetherness, but it's, it's the idea that all of these things are discussed. It's, it's an interdependent way of growing up um, where, where all of those issues are discussed within the family, um, and it allows Dutch parents to, to um, retain a kind of, um, she calls it a soft control, 
over their kids because they're, they're always talking about these issues. They allow, if kids have significant others, they allow them to sleep over um, and they have to negotiate the terms of those sleepovers, which is you know safer, um, probably more pleasant and, and works because when, when you look at research comparing Dutch and American teens, they have everything we say we want. You know, they're, they're, their early sexual experiences are, uh, they have few, lower rates of pregnancy, lower rates of disease. They're more likely to, they have fewer partners. Um, they they uh, are less likely to be drunk when they have their early sexual experiences. They enjoy them more. They communicate with their partners better, like everything. And what they say, yeah, it comes down to um, parents talking, parents, um, Dutch parents, teachers and doctors talk to kids from a really early age about sex, about pleasure, and about the importance of having a loving relationship with your partner. And in particular, I thought a lot about when I, when I wrote about that, how Americans, it wasn't that Americans weren't able to or willing to have conversations with their kids, but we tend to focus when we have those conversations on risk and danger. And the Dutch reframe it as responsibility, personal responsibility, personal responsibility and joy. Um, and as a parent myself, that really hit me in the solar plexus because I thought, totally before I did this work, I would have thought I talked to my kid about you know contraception and disease protection and consent because I'm modern. <laughs> Job done, right? And you know whether I, and and now I know that that's not enough. And so I just want to say um, because I know you now all want a script, and I don't have a script, <laughs> but. I do have a website, which is my name, PeggyOrnstein.com, that has massive resources for people of all, age, you know, depending on the age of your kids, your kids' sexuality, your kids' gender, the different issues that you want to discuss that will offer resources. And there's one in particular, because I, know, I heard them say at the intro um, tonight that this event was partly hosted by Urban School, right? They said that? And Urban happens to have, I don't know if anybody's here from Urban, if there's Urban parents here, but your kids have the best health education some of the best health education in the country um, because Shafia Zaloum is the teacher. Yep, give it up for Shafia. And for those of you who don't have kids at Urban, she has a book called Sex, Teens, and Everything in Between that came out earlier this year, or earlier last year, 2019, that really does offer um, for parents of teenagers some concrete discussion points and sort of more scripted ideas of how you can talk to your kids about all the issues we've brought up tonight. So I highly recommend that book. The next question. On the left, up at the top. Hi, um, it's exciting to be able to say thank you. This is a moment of gratitude. I heard you on Fresh Air the other day, and um, you said um, raising boys in this moment is a thrilling task. And um, I've really felt seen. I am a single mom, and um, we're in a dyad, and we do have a lot of coziness and conversations. But I will say that people that have not yet teenagers, you still have to buckle up. Um, and yeah. so I'm grateful for your book. Thank you. Um, secondly, my question is, and I, I'm really grateful that you talk about the mainstream media and the porn because I feel like our conversations that have been so lovely and connected have been completely interrupted by mainstream media, by social media, and um, yeah, it's been really hard to struggle with that. And my question though is about narcissism, uh, something that frightens me and I see, uh, of course I see it everywhere in the country, uh, in the White House. And, um, but I'm, I'm worried because I see little shreds of it in my beautiful 13-year-old. Mm, mm, interesting. Yeah, I talk in the book, I, I use a phrase of the narcissism of male desire um, and the ways that boys learn to refract female behavior through the lens of their, of their wishes and desires um, and, and put um, their pleasure before women's feelings and in some ways for that reason I actually in the whole Me Too allegations when they that first started coming out I found the Aziz Ansari story to be one of the more interesting stories not because what he did was um, necessarily illegal and and you could argue very strongly I think that that was a irresponsibly reported story but I felt like 
it also just sh laid bare those dynamics, both of female socialization and male socialization, and that um, showed the ways that he was just this like, you know, over eager dude who was willing to um, just ignore what a partner's hesitation in order to do what he wanted to do, to see her limits as um, a challenge that he was supposed to get over. Um, so I, I think that that is a, um, a, a potential vulnerability in the ways that, that boys are raised. And I guess your son is a, a little young to read a book like this, but um, my hope in part was in, in writing it and in maybe, you know, maybe there's some podcasts or, um, or articles where I've talked about these things that are age appropriate for him. Um, but to start, um, but I, I, I wanted to start that conversation too um, among guys to sort of think about how those dynamics play out and again, how they can um, get in the way of acknowledge of, of personal accountability and the ways, and there, and there was another piece that we didn't talk about, which is a little pivot off of what, you're, what you were asking, but I think when we do have the conversation about assault, that too often we tend to only think about good guys and monsters and you know that, that if you assault, you must be a monster and only monsters assault. And that can again blind us and undermine um, personal accountability among good guys because you know good guys can do a bad thing. And what you do when that happens is really um, the important part of the story. So, and, and I had a lot of guys who were talking to me who were, who were wrestling with that, who felt that they had done, I, I actually at one point wanted to call this book, um, I know I'm a good guy, but, um, because I heard that so often, um, my publisher wouldn't let me because, you know, girls and sex, boys and sex, you gotta do that. Um, but, but it was really interesting to hear, to, because, and, and, what, and, and again, what was hopeful for me in that was that a lot of the stories that came after that line I know I'm a good guy, but, and then they would tell me the story of a time they weren't a good guy. I don't think that men 10, 15, 20 years ago would even recognize that those were moments when they hadn't been a good guy. So it felt like, you know, it's not like, it's not enough, but it was progress to me that guys, that young men were starting to question um, some of that behavior and see it as problematic and wrestle with what that meant. So I think that that, that idea is moving, but I think that, that surfacing, you're right, that surfacing those dynamics and surfacing the impact of gender socialization on how we interact with one another is really super important. Top right. Hi, Peggy. Um, I have a 15-year-old son, and I really wish this book had come out like five years ago, um, but I'm thrilled Sorry. that it's here. Um, and, you know, I totally hear you on the point about parents and having these conversations. And, in fact, I've done a lot of things, so many things, that I'm getting to the point of, like, Mom, I know, shut up, yeah. kind of a thing. So I'm wondering, and then, you know, I'll be riding along listening to my son's playlist with him in the car and just think, how am I ever going to stop this avalanche that is in his AirPods every day with just the, the most horrible messaging about women and sex and that is now like mainstream popular music? So yep. it feels like I'm just chirping away and there's a, just this loud chorus of culture and everything that sends completely opposite messaging. So I'm wondering, are... I mean, things that are group oriented, like did you find that boys opened up more when they were in groups, when there were facilitators that weren't their parents? Like he goes to a Catholic school, so he's not gonna get it there, but I'm just wondering <laughs> what other um, opportunities there are in addition to the parents. Um, well, I think there, there's, there's both individual um, things I can say and, and sort of group things. So. You know, on an individual level, I, I also think it's not only parents. Like, you can, um, you can outsource some of these conversations and discussions to the cool uncle or the cool aunt or the cool cousin or, you know, whomever the designated cool person is in your extended family um, or friend group. And I know that, you know, I have, um, as I was, don't tell them, I'm, are we still on the radio when we're doing the Q&A? 
I Maybe. I can hear. I was, I was texting with my nephew today about porn, um, <laughs> as one does, again, uh, <laughs> with one's aunt. And, but, you know, I, I have long been that person, I, and, and I was not in any way born being able to have these conversations, I want to be clear, like this was not easy for me. And, and it was with really my nieces and my nephews that I started having a lot of these more um, really graphic and, and clear and walk in my talk kind of conversations and wanting to fall, wanting the ground to split open and swallow me up as I was having them. Um, and, uh, but in addition to, I think, being useful to them, I also felt that they created a relationship. My, my nieces and nephews are all adults now. They're all over 25, and um, the youngest is 25. And we have really great relationships, and I, and I feel like we that those relationships happened because um, I showed up for them. And, and I had those difficult conversations, and I said, you know, I am the person that you can tell anything. Do not be afraid. And they responded to that, the, the, the boys and the, the men and the women now. They're adult men and adult women. Um, so, so sometimes I think that we, we tend to emphasize the awkward and the excruciating when we can also think about how this can enrich relationships and how we can expand it, yeah, beyond that parent group. So that's the, the personal part. But there are, I mean, we have a lot more um, organizations that support girls in these progressive and, and feminist ways than boys right now. And I, and I think that there's, you know, there's people who are looking into trying to create more of that, particularly in the Bay Area. Some schools have affinity groups, that sort of thing. But there's also, um, you know, one place, another place is, is coaches. If, if your son is um, on a team with a um, wonderful coach, I mean, sometimes the coaches are part of the problem, but it, <laughs> Seriously, sometimes they're part of the problem. I boys talked about that too. But they could also, I felt like those, uh, I know that those all-male enclaves, I mean, on one hand, you know, they can be a bastion of the worst kind of bro culture, but they can also be a crucible of change. And there's things like um, here in the Bay Area, we have Futures Without Violence, right? And they have the program Coaching Boys Into Men, um, which is a really, it's a national program, but it's a really light intervention by coaches. Uh, of high school boys, and they just had a report out, they've been doing it with middle school boys, and found that um, having this just weekly 10-minute discussion with coaches, when they follow those boys out, they have significantly reduced va um, rates of causing sexual harm, significantly um, less of that kind of locker room talk, and significantly higher rates of um, stepping in as bystanders, as well as um, lower rates of dating violence. So you can see that, that having, having a, a, a kind of organized intervention, as you were saying, or having discussion, um, having a place where boys can talk, having a place where a, a, a adult, and maybe particularly a man that they respect, is leading that conversation, disrupts and changes the culture and really makes a difference in their lives. Conversations. Conversations, because yeah, because it's not obviously, I mean, I think you're all clear it's not the talk, right? <laughs> it's not the talk. You would not sit down with your children, with your child, and say, okay, table manners. Um, the fork goes on the left, and this is how you hold the knife, and put your napkin, don't burp at the table, and um, say, please pass, and thank you, and excuse me when you get up, and okay. <laughs> We've had the talk about table manners. Go forth. You know, you wouldn't do that. And I think that our interpersonal relationships are at least as important as our table manners. <laughs> So if you had to tell your child to say thank you 578,964 times, which I believe is the number that makes it work, <laughs> I'm not sure, you're going to have to have more than one conversation about, you know, about sex, but not about sex, about consent, but not just about consent, about media, about accountability, about all these different things. And, you know, and like I said, some of it is, I think those conversations can be generated by what's in the book. Some of it I put at the end of the book. Some of it, you can just keep on going on my website and find stuff there. The next question is on your left. Hi. Um, I've been hearing lately a lot of men talk about how they feel, they have to feel sexually connected before they can be emotionally involved. And then women saying, actually, I have to feel an emotional connection before I can be sexually involved. So I like to think I'm the cool aunt and talking to my um, cousins recently, the boys were saying, you have to hook up with a girl to have any kind of feelings. 
and you know the girls were saying, no, you have to feel something for that boy to do it. And I'm just kind of curious, do you see this hookup culture um, evolving or changing or taking people's feelings uh, in account, or is this more really a physical thing and we're not going to see the return of the relationship anytime soon? Because I feel like when I was a teenager, you know, 20 some years ago, that was the thing, is like you wanted to be in a committed relationship. Like everybody wanted to have a boyfriend that they could like be with for a while. Um, do we see that coming back? And not, I mean, I don't know if it's a necessary thing, but like right. what's the projection that we're on? And you know, relationships, to be fair, they can have their own issues. But um, young people go in, the truth is that they go in and out of, of hookup culture and relationships. So the relationships for sure still exist, absolutely. Um, and, and having that kind of connection. And most young people, including boys, say that they prefer to be sexual in a context of a trusting relationship and they have um, better experiences in that context. Um, so, so that's definitely there. And hookup culture, I mean, I definitely, as, as I said earlier, I had guys and I had girls when I was doing the interviews for these two books who were into hookup culture and did not want to be, um, you know, wanted to be striving for this sort of ideal of that culture, which is, I don't know, to be devoid of feelings in some way, which is not really humanly possible, but there you go. Um, most kids were more ambivalent about it than that and, and, and didn't feel that that was really working out for them. Um, so I guess what I ended up feeling was, I think hookup culture could be conducted in a friendlier way. I think that it could be a more benevolent place. I think it doesn't have to be quite so adversarial and quite as hostile um, as it often can be. I don't think it has to be quite so competitive as it often can feel. Um, but right now, I think that culture tends to teach young people more what they don't want um, than, than what they do. To your right, Center. Hello, um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually from Colombia, and I'm one of the few, I'm right here on your right. Oh, okay, thank you, <laughs> sorry. I can't see because the okay. lights are super bright. Um, I am one of the few educa sex educators of color, and I feel like it is very important to also bring into the conversation um, when we talk about black boys yeah. and brown boys, and how um, you know, like uh, we are teaching them. Uh, we're talking about boys, but but in in um, like I can I guess kind of my question is like. We cannot really just generalize, right? Because Absolutely. we talk about intersectionality. We talk about how um, sure. black and brown boys also carry intergenerational trauma, and how they are kind of put into this line of like, okay, they because of media, how media portrays them, they kind of really need to like navigate, especially yeah. when they're navigating uh, the white culture. So I wanted to hear a little bit yeah. more about that in your research. Thank like, you so much for asking that question. I really appreciate it. So, yeah, boys are not boys are not boys. Masculinity is not masculinity. It's not masculinity. I talked a little bit about queer boys. Um, I also talk about trans boys in the book, and I have a chapter that specifically looks at um, at boys of color um, and the ways that that affects that ethnicity changes some of these conversations. Some of them are the same. Some of them are not the same. And I particularly was interested in looking at um, uh, African American and Asian American boys, and and the and I and I will say that the guys that I spoke with were in a very particular, um, and 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 Latinx boys um, sort of there there was there was sort of a, more of a range of how they related to these issues depending, in a great deal on their on how they looked physically, um, how they related to a lot of these things. But um, the uh, boys that I was talking to, the boys of color, were also in a sort of, in a, in a more white environment. So they were, they were in the classes with these other guys. They were uh, in colleges and mostly in high schools where um, their, their public world um, was more white. Their private world back home um, in their neighborhoods, not necessarily so. And the African American, the reason that I, that I really focused on that, those two groups in particular was that they felt like flip sides of a coin with white masculinity kind of controlling the toss and white masculinity as being the sort of neutral thing that, that people, you know, 
saw as the, the norm and then projected onto African-American boys a kind of hypersexuality um, and you know a coolness, but a coolness that could turn really fast into being um, a suspe you know a, a, a accusation of being predatory or criminal. Um, and the African American boys that I spoke with were sort of th there was a lot they, they carried a lot of anxiety around that, um, and it affected how they how how things went down in their social world. And um, like one of the guys said to me. Um, you know, I'm not. He was in college. And he's like, I'm not going to go party with a br bunch of drunk white kids at a at a frat because anything can happen. And if I'm the only black guy in the room, I'm the only black guy in the room. You know, I mean, there was this real s fear of losing everything that they'd built um, through some kind of social interaction gone wrong, or that they would be punished for things, and justifiably so, they felt this. Um, that a white guy might be able to get away with, even if, if what they did was not right. So they were much more conscious of ideas around consent, um, and they were also carrying the intergenerational trauma, as you suggested, of um, accusations of assault that had been used as social control of African American men um, for generations. And that could come into conflict with white feminists in particular, who were trying to reform ideas about sexual assault on campus because you had, on one hand, this group for whom accusations were used as a tool of social control, and on the other hand, all women, um, regardless of ethnicity, for whom um, rape itself was used as a to, uh, tool of social control. So that could cause tension and was important to understand. Um, and then on the other side of that, when I was talking about Asian American boys, um, what was projected onto them was emasculation and asexuality. And that was a whole different psychological stressor that they were carrying. So uh, one guy, there, there's a lot of sexual racism on swipe apps. And one guy um, was saying to me that he had matched with a girl on Tinder and they went back and forth for a while. And then she said, well, so, you know, we could be friends, but no offense, I don't date Asian guys. And he just turned to me and went, how is that no offense? <laughs> you know? And, and I think that, um, you know, obviously parents of color know how to talk to their kids about race, but I think for, as a, as a larger society, um, and especially now when kids are very conscious of these issues, it's interesting, it was interesting to me to see the way that they left that at the door in social situations, that they could um, not necessarily see or acknowledge that they were engaging in either gendered racism or sexual racism in their interactions. And so it became very important to me to surface what that looked like for those guys in those communities and then by association hoping that you know, we, can, we can have a larger conversation about the ways that all these different things mediate ideas about masculinity and sex. We have time for one last question. Just a reminder, Peggy will be signing books out in the atrium uh, following the program. So the next question is up on the left. Um, hi, I, I admittedly have not read the book yet, but I will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I've heard you talk a lot, and today we haven't really spoken too much about uh, my son's age group is about 20 in college, and he's experiencing, and friends, boys the same age, um, a fear of being in relationships because of the kind of, I don't know how to put it, but backlash around the Me Too mm -hmm. movement and girls um, turning things into things that maybe didn't happen. You know, he said, she said, and um, just wondering if the boys that you talked to talked about that at all, sort of how they're dealing with that, and there's a big fear that I'm sensing and hearing about. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard, I, I, I do hear that question, and I think, um, you know, the reality, of course, is that false accusations are, are rare, and also the reality is there was just a, a report out the other day of the of top schools' rates of assault and um, rates of expulsion. Uh, the, the, actually, it was the state of New York, so they had like Columbia, um, Cornell, um, the Sunnis, things like that. So, like at Columbia, I think the number all of, it was like 281 assaults and two expulsions, um, and they all kind of look like that. 
Cornell looked like that, SUNY looked like that. So the, the reality of that does not really play out. But so the fear though, what is, you know, you, you have to then address like, what is that fear about? Um, and, and I think it is a fear that um, you can't behave in the ways that guys didn't have to think about in the past. Um, and the best way to ameliorate that fear is through really excellent um, education and providing boys with and girls with resources to understand um, what, a, again, what a mutually gratifying, reciprocal, consensual relationship, whether it lasts five years or 50 years or five minutes, um, what that looks like and when they don't carry that with them into their college experience, when they don't have that knowledge, it just creates um, a lot of anxiety and concern. I'd also say that one thing that is clear in research is that young men's idea about consent is, um, can be kind of elastic. And that um, there's, there was research out of the University of Michigan where they were asking college guys who could define consent in a basic way, um, the way that we would expect them to conf hope that they would be able to define it. When they then asked their last experience in a hookup and in a relationship, um, when their actions did not meet their definition, they tended to expand the definition rather than look at their actions. Um, so I think that there's a combination of things that need to happen with young men um, who are feeling that fear that involve understanding the dynamics that they may engage in um, and understanding what um, the expectations and realities are of having a, a ethical, um, legal, like Shafia always says sex should be ethical, legal, ethical, and good. And I think if we you know, have that in our minds and have that as a long game and have that as how we're talking to our young people with that goal in mind, that some of that fear will evaporate and balance out. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.